So I thought today, rather than me jumping right into the sermon like normal, that I might be able to get, get a little help from you guys. We're on the Ten Commandments series, and I thought it would be neat to hear what you think when you hear the term Ten Commandments. So I'm curious, anybody willing, anybody willing to come on up and... Uh, Okay, I, that was easy. <laughs> Did, is this thing on? This it, not on. Is, is it? It's, it's going to be on, hopefully. Check one. There oh, it is. There it's there on. <laughs> so, so, Jim, thanks yeah. for being so eager and My ready pleasure. to go. My pleasure. And uh, so, out of curiosity, when you think of the Ten Commandments, what comes to your mind? Well, we all know the Ten Commandments. Yeah. It's really easy. We know them. I know them. I mean, I can give you... I can give them to you in order, start to finish, right Really? Oh, yeah, easy. Okay, I, I'm not going to put that burden on you, but let's do this. Let's just do the first commandment. Number one. One, two, goes right straight in order, right? It's chronological <laughs> order. One, okay. two. Okay, that, that's not exactly what I meant, but I see what you're saying. Oh. I meant, like, what, what is, what's the wording of the first commandment? Because there's, you know, each of them have words, right. not just one. But right. So, you, you, do you know the first commandment? Uh, what, help me out here. Okay. So, it started out with you. 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 I don't want to put you on the spot. No, it's okay. I got it. Oh, okay. It okay. Right oh, you, okay. You're ready to you, go then. You. Shall. Shall. You shall. Oh. Ten Commandments. Yeah, I got it. You shall not. Not. <laughs> you, you shall not mm. <laughs> have. 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 Are you sure? Yes. It's have. Have. Really? Yeah. Well, this is the NIV version, but. Okay. You shall not have any. Any. You. You shall not have any gods, gods before, before me. me. <laughs> Told you. <laughs> Told you. Yeah, it's all right Got there. Got right there. Yeah. Never left. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, and you understand what that's talking about. You know, this is, the, God shared this at Mount Sinai. The Israelites just came out of Egypt where they had hundreds of gods. Right. And he's letting them know. There's only one God, we, we, one God, and I'm him. I want you to worship me, one God. We, we, we know there's only one God, one yeah. real God, yeah. the God, the one real God. Exactly. And yeah. it's not like he has any competition. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, well, let's agree. say he did. <laughs> say he did. Say God of the Coolio. Coolio? The Coolio God. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, so this Coolio God would have like, Churches, massive churches, they'd be everywhere. In competition with God. Absolutely, total competition. And these churches would be like they have one in Franklin, Ohio, like where you came from, okay. Ohio. Okay, okay. Okay, so these massive churches are, are big, huge. They'd have a million people on staff. A million staff people. A million okay. staff people. Think about it. They'd hire, yeah. they'd hire a lot of people. And take the youth director. Okay. Okay, so the youth director's probably got this giant youth room, and they'd have... Xbox Connect. Oh, videos. Yeah, video so games. They can, yeah, connect with the kids. Oh, okay. That's okay. what they do. And then and then they jam out like the Taylor Swift. Brush it off. Brush it off. It's it's sh shake it off. Shake it off. Yeah, I know shake that. Shake it off. Okay. I know that. Okay. So this Coolio God church is that are all over the place. They have they're so big, they have like a lazy river. With water? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Warm natural warm water. For the sermons. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And okay. you can listen. You can just float. You can listen to a sermon. And say they'd have a funeral, you know. You could just kind of float right on by. So sorry for your loss. You know. <laughs> and and that, that'd be like a little competition, of yeah. course, with the real God. Yeah. Well, I, I, Jim, that's really, you know, it's not exactly where I thought you were going to go with all this. Oh. But, hey. Appreciate your thoughts, and, and thanks for helping us out. Yeah. And maybe maybe somewhere down the long line further in the future. You know? I know them all. Yeah, well, we'll see what happens. But thank order. you, buddy. Oh, I sure. appreciate it. Thanks for helping us out. And, and uh, wouldn't, wouldn't you like to live just an hour in his head? That would be what happened. 
So we are looking, oh, I don't need this. We are looking at the Ten Commandments, and recently uh, I happened to see a connection in my own life with the Ten Commandments, so bear with me here. Uh, I don't know if some of you know this, we recently got some chickens uh, about four weeks ago. Here's my wife with uh, Precious on her shoulder. Uh, that was last week, and they're, they're getting big. They're, they're about this tall now, and, and so as they're getting bigger, I thought, we got to get something for them. They can't stay in totes in our garage, so I got on Amazon, and I ordered uh, a chicken coop, and, uh, and, and it finally came in the mail, and I, I busted it apart, and I'm looking at it here, and, I, and it came with one of these instruction manuals with all of the detailed pieces and, and, and all these rules, you know, like, for example, you take... Sorry about that. Take part A, and you want to not put connect it to part B. Instead, you want to connect it to part double D. And, and incredibly confusing. And, and I'm, I'm trying to figure this thing out and lay all of the stuff out. Different, there are eight different screws that came with it. And you, you can't use screw number one on piece A. You got to use screw number four. On, screw double, uh, on piece double F, that's where you use screw number one. And so incredibly confusing. And, and then that's when I realized that some of the pieces didn't have stickers on them. So now I've got to figure out what pieces are those. And then as I'm going through the manual, I'm realizing, I'm looking through this and I'm thinking, wow, you know, it, there's rules in here about things I'm not supposed to do with this chicken coop. Like in the back of the manual, it says, do not allow children to stay over the night in the coop. <laughs> and I'm like, well, there goes that idea. That would have, that would have been a good idea. Uh, and so after about three and a half hours going through this thing, I'm just, I'm, I'm realizing that this chicken coop company is trying to control my life, telling me what to do, what not to do, where to put the chicken coop, what I can use it for, how to put it together, how not to put it together. And I just gave up. And so I brought it here. And I thought, you guys could help me do this because it's a mess, and I don't know if I can. Um, here's the, the real truth of the matter is we, we got two coops in the mail, and they didn't want the second one, so it's a sermon illustration is what it is. But, but uh, it, it, this, this chicken coop company and their, their, their manual, it's not really to make my, my life harder. It's not really to try to control me and make things difficult. It's meant to help me, right? That's what it's really for. The, mo the moment I throw this out is the moment it gets really much more difficult than this manual will ever make it. And I'm thinking about the Ten Commandments. It, God gives the Ten Commandments these rules. Uh, there's, there's our coop, by the way, in the backyard. Uh, he gives these Ten Commandments to us not as a, a way to suppress us, not as a way to bind us. He gives them to us so that we can have hope and life. They're not meant to confine us. They're meant to give us life. And so we're going to today look at the first of the Ten Commandments. He wants us to have a life that's worth living. And the Ten Commandments can help us do that very thing. So over the next 10 weeks, we're going to look at the Ten Commandments. Today we're starting with commandment number one. And like Jim said, we all know the commandments, right? We've all heard of the Ten Commandments. So uh, you guys probably know them, right? So I thought we would have a little quiz that's right. If you got your sermon notes, grab those, open them up. On the first page there, you'll see 10 lines. Uh, they do not have to be in order, and you do not have to word them perfectly. But if you have notes, try to do your best. We're going to take just a minute or so and try to see if you can get all 10 commandments. No cheating. Nobody shares with anybody else. Just do the best you can. If you didn't get sermon, nights, sermon notes, just hang out for a little bit. We'll be ready to go in just a second. Are you guys ready to start? Here we go. People still working. A little bit longer. Did you figure them out? <laughs> All right. 
righty. So how did you guys do? Anybody get all 10 of them, you think? Any? Really? Good job, Nancy. I, I, I've done this a couple times, and I usually get about nine, and I can't figure out what, which one I'm missing. And uh, so I thought, let's go over them real quick. And again, they don't have to be in order. They don't have to be worded perfectly. I do have them in order, though. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. We had that one. That was a clue earlier. Number two, you shall not make for yourself an idol. The King James says, grave an image. Number three, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God or take it in vain. You can word it differently. Number four, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And number five, this is the one I always forget, honor your father and mother. Number six, you shall not murder. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Eight, you shall not steal. Nine, you shall not give false testimony or lie. That's what it is. And number 10, you shall not covet. Okay, Nancy, you said you had 10. Did you get all 10 right? Yes, good job. I should have had gift cards today. Ah, uh, too bad. Okay, according to Newsweek, uh, which went out of print, and now they're back in print again. According to Newsweek, the average evangelical Christian gets four out of ten. How many did at least average as the most average Christians? Anybody do more? Anybody do more? It's, it's a little harder than you think, huh? We think we know the Ten Commandments until we're put on the spot. Um, all Ten Commandments. These, I mean, these are the big ten. You would think we would know them, wouldn't you? So I think what we'll do over the next 10 weeks, we're going to work. I'm going to encourage you to work with me to memorize all of them as we go. We might even give you some tools, some helps, so that you can always remember them. Uh, and uh, we'll do that over the next 10 weeks. And today we're looking at commandment number one. So if you have your Bibles, grab them. Bible apps, let's open them together to Exodus chapter 20. Uh, Israel has made their way from Egypt to Mount Sinai. And it's about 50 days after their deliverance. And God uh, is, is talking with Moses on the mountain. Uh, actually, once he wanted originally to talk to all of the Israelites, but when he introduced himself with the thunderings and the lightnings and the clouds, they freaked out and said, no, 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 we can't do this. And they said, Moses, you be our man. You be our, you be our person. And so he's kind of the, uh, the guy who's uh, intercepting God. And he begins here by, by sharing verse, verse 1, chapter 20, we read, And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. That's commandment number one. If you have your notes there, you can write that down. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, there's a reason this is the first commandment because it's the foundation. It's kind of the foundation for all the rest. You got to start somewhere. You start with there is one God and God's him. That's where we start. And now we've heard this before, but God shares it here in Exodus 20. It's, when he shares this at the time of the world history, it's a pretty radical concept. Remember, they just came from Egypt where there were all kinds of gods. In fact, I went this week and I counted them. I stopped when I got over 100. There were over 100 different gods the Egyptians worshipped. And that's where Israel's been for 400 years. So they're very uh, aware that they live in a world where people worship many gods. And really, if you think about it, it's kind of like today. Now, some of you are thinking, wait a minute, we don't have a bunch of gods here in America. Uh, but what, what is a god? What is a god? Uh, I would say a god is something that you revere, something that you love. Something that you kind of put up on a pedestal in life. Uh, you, make, you make it the most important thing in your life. He's God, right? Something that consumes a, a chunk of your time, your energy, your finances, your, your thoughts. Now, you tell me, for most people, does that definition wrap itself around the living God of the Bible? Is he that person? I think for a lot of people anyway... That's things that would be more defined as cars and, and houses and maybe their work or their relationships or hobbies or sports or travel or, you know, there are other things that are way more important that they invest a lot more time and a lot more finances and a lot more energy in than the God 
the relationship with the God of the Bible. Thankfully, not everybody, but for the majority, I think there are lots of different gods to this day. People still worship many gods. God's not going to force anybody to worship him. However, he does let us know throughout Scripture that there are consequences if we don't. We just need to know that. If you don't want to worship him as the one true God, he's not going to make you. But there are consequences if you don't worship God and God only. And the first consequence is just a matter of time we'll experience this. Life will seem out of control. Life will seem out of control. Where does that come from? Well, seriously, God created the world. He's the one He's the only one who can really control everything. He's sovereign God. Now, we're at a time now where evil has corrupted things. The enemy, Satan, has got his influences all over the place. But even above him, there's a God, and he's wrapping, He's going to wrap things up. He's going to make everything right. He's going to judge all wrong, the Bible says. Nothing's getting past him. And, uh, and he's God, and he's in control. Nothing's slipping by him. God is in control. But if God is not our God, then we are going to try to take control. And we do this very, very easily in life. There are areas in our life we start taking control, and before long we realize we can't do it, and we start losing control, and we get all stressed out. And, and, and so if that's you, if your life is stressing you out completely, I want to encourage you, just look at who's in control. Is it God? Are you doing this his way? Are you trying to take the reins of your life? Could it be that you're trying to exert control where God should be leading and guiding? He's God, remember. He's good. We said it a few years ago. You can trust him. And if you don't, the first consequence is you you were never meant to control all of your life. He's God. You're not. It's his job to control Here's another consequence. If we don't worship God only, we'll struggle to find real meaning in life. What will happen is we play the God role, and, uh, and then so we start defining it ourselves. But think this through for a second. If God is all good, and he's all knowing, and he's all powerful, and he created you, don't you think he knows why he created you? Why he allowed you to be part of his creation? He made you for a reason. And it's not to be your own God of your own life, doing life your way. See, when you do it your way, you make up your own purpose, your own meaning in life. And so let me ask you, what is the meaning of your life? For some people, it's amassing lots of stuff. For some, it's all about family. For others, it's about having fun. You know, enjoy the, while, the ride while, you, while, while you're riding it, right? What is the meaning of your life? Here's another question to think about. Why would we let someone lesser than an all-good, all-knowing, all-powerful God decide what the meaning of life is for us, even if it's us deciding? Why would we do that? It's no wonder people struggle with the meaning of life because if they're not tapping into the one who knows all, they will be clueless. They'll end up making all kinds of things. The the wrong thing, the meaning for life. We don't want to forget about number three. It's important too, another consequence. God provides the only escape from death and hell. Uh, So if we don't worship God only, then we're in trouble. We potentially have death and hell in front of us. Only God offers us escape. So we need to make sure we know it's a huge price to pay if you don't worship God and Him only. Here's another question for you. By and large, do you think that the world has kind of pushed God to the sidelines and they're doing it their own way? I think it's all over the place. What's the result of us doing this? Confusion. We've got messes. It's interesting. The further we sideline God, look at what's happened to politics in America. It's a disaster. No matter which side you're on, it's a gigantic mess. Uh, Some of the simple things that we always knew in life, we're getting confused about what a man is, what a woman is, 
Uh, we're losing our grip. We're redefining things because it doesn't suit our purposes. So we redefine marriage. See, we start ignoring the one true God and his plan that he put in place. It's just a matter of time. Things are going to get really messy because God's a God of order. God says, you shall have no other gods before me. Imagine if, if, if the world did that fully. I mean, there, you know, there are consequences, consequences if we don't, but there are also benefits if we do. Benefits if we worship God only. And the first would be there's hope, even in a world of uncertainty. All, you know, Jesus himself says, in this world, you'll have troubles. We live in a fallen, broken world. In the, in the book of Revelation, Jesus says, I am making all things new. And we're in that process right now. His coming is a big part of that process. Ten commandments before that, part of the process. All of this, God is doing, and he's going to, in the end, it's going to make everything new. But right now, we live in a very broken, uncertain world. A world that a lot of people don't have hope in. And so with God being the only true God, we can have hope. Um, if, if you make your job your hope, what happens when you lose your job? If you make relationships in your life your hope, what happens when somebody passes away? What happens when the relationship ends? If money's your hope, what happens when the stock market crashes? We've seen that happen a few times in my life. If you put your hope in money and the economy tanks, all of a sudden you're, you might lose all your hope. But when you put your hope in God, realizing that he's the one who's all-knowing, all-powerful, he's the one who holds the future, he's the one who can raise the dead to life into eternal life, you realize that he's the only one who has lasting hope. It's kind of like when you, when you have a, a really bad week, but you know your vacation's coming. You ever been there before? Two weeks away, you got this great vacation plan, and man, you're just having the, the most horrible week. Everything's hitting the fan. And, and what gets you through? What, what gets you through these tough days? <gasps> that vacation. We, eight days, I'm going to be on gun vacation. Seven days, I'm going to be there in four days. I can get through this. You've got hope. You can't see it yet, but you know it's coming, and that's the way it is with the Lord. We live in a world that's very uncertain, very dysfunctional, but we can have hope. It's a benefit of worshiping God and God only. Here's another benefit. It's, it, there's real purpose and meaning in life. Real purpose and meaning. If all, an all-good, all-powerful, all-knowing God, if the God of the Bible created us, you can be assured he made you for a reason. You're not an accident. You're not a fluke of nature. There is a real purpose. There's real meaning to life. I want you to think of something real quick. Uh, my mom was a senior in high school. Early part of the school year, she gets pregnant from a married man with me. Her life gets turned upside down. Her whole senior year, she's getting larger and larger. Feels like everybody's staring at her. If there is anyone in this world who could think of themselves as an accident, it's me. I have every reason to think that. My mom never married him, married somebody else. And yet, as I grew up and started getting to know the God of the Bible, and I started reading, I realized he says, I'll be a father to the fatherless. You can be my son. You can be my daughter. And you know what? When I realized that he had a plan for me and a purpose for me, it changed everything in my life. It made me realize I'm not an accident. Yeah, that might have been an accidental situation, but God has a purpose and a plan for me, just like he has a purpose and a plan for you. And when we obey God, the God, and he's the one true God, and he's the one we worship, you can realize there's real meaning. There's purpose for your life. There's another benefit. There's peace because God is in control. One more benefit. There's peace because God is in control. See, when you have no God but God, and he's your God, there's a freedom that comes. Because he's got this. He's God and he's got this. And to a great degree, the pressure can be off. Why? Because you're not alone. Because someone is with you. He never leaves you or forsakes you. 
You belong to someone. You're a part of something bigger than just you. And you know what? When you get that scope, it brings peace to you. It'll change your outlook. It'll change the way you make your decisions in life, all because there is no God but the one true God. There are great benefits to having no God but God. And there are benefits to obeying His command. There are consequences if we don't obey His commands and don't see Him as the one true God. It's kind of like this chicken coop. I get rid of the, the owner's manual. Life doesn't get easier for me. It gets incredibly difficult to try to figure this out all by itself. I'll be putting it together and taking it back apart and then putting it together again. You know, and same goes with the Bible. God gives us this instruction manual for life so that we can realize there is order, there is a plan, there is a purpose. Obey Him so that you can live a life with purpose and meaning, so you can live a life that has order and functionality and health. So how do we obey His commands? Sounds kind of a simple question. See, when we worship God as God, there's a voice that we need to listen to, His voice. It gives us direction in life. He's the power that we depend on. And, and listen, the Bible is very clear. The God of the Bible is above all. He is the boss, but he's a loving, benevolent boss. In fact, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus comes on the scene. It's the end of his life. He's just raised from the dead. He's conquered death, hell, and sin. And remember what he said at the beginning of the Great Commission? He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Those are the words of Jesus. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, which means what? That the buck stops at him. All other gods of the world, they're nothing. He has all authority. And he, not just, he doesn't just say it. He's just proved it by conquering death and hell and sin. And, and this is so important for us because it makes us realize there is only one God but him. And of all people, the Israelites should have realized this. I mean, here they are. They've just come out of Egypt where they worship hundreds of gods. And, and 50 days later, they're at Mount Sinai. And God comes down. Verse 3, he says, I am the Lord your God. Verse 2, I am the Lord your God. I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no gods but me. No other gods before me. And remember, back in Egypt... Hundreds of gods. I don't know if you ever realize this, but when the plagues came in Egypt, the ten plagues that God used to ultimately deliver the Israelites from slavery, those plagues were not just a demonstration of the power and might of Almighty God, the God of Israel. They were a demonstration of how God is the only God and the gods of Egypt were powerless. Because if you look very closely at Egyptian history and look at those plagues, you'll see that there is a link between a lot of those plagues, all of the plagues, and the gods of Egypt. Let me show you what I mean. When, when he turned the water into blood, that was an assault. It wasn't just a plague for the Pharaoh's uh, rebellion. It was an assault on one of the gods, the god of Hopi, an Egyptian god of the Nile. And then beyond that, when God made frogs come up out of the Nile, it was an assault on Heket, the Egyptian goddess of fertility, who had the head of a frog. You can go back to the ancient uh, hieroglyphics and see she had the head of a frog. Then there's the God that turned dust, excuse me, when God turned dust uh, into gnats, remember that? That was an assault on Geb. Geb, he was the Egyptian god of the earth. God did all of this, and the Egyptian gods did nothing. They could do nothing. They were powerless. They were made nothing. Then God brought flies. That was an assault on Kepri, the Egyptian god of creation who moved the sun and had the head of a flying bug. Then the Egyptian, then God rather brought a plague to kill cattle and livestock. That was an assault on, on Hathor, uh, the Egyptian goddess of love and protection. She oftentimes in ancient Egypt was depicted as a goddess with the head of a cow. Not in this picture, but she had the head of a cow. Uh, then came the boils. That was an assault on Isis, who was the god of medicine, goddess of medicine and health. She could do nothing when the boils came. Only when God stopped it did people get better. Then came the hail, which was an assault on Newt, the goddess of the sky, who was powerless. Then came the locust, an assault on Seth, goddess of disorder and chaos. Then came darkness, an assault on Ra, the sun god. Did nothing, could do nothing against God. 
Then came death. And that was an assault on Pharaoh himself. Because Pharaoh was seen as a god of absolute power. And he could do nothing, even losing his own family member. And God demonstrated power and authority over all of them. Now catch this picture. He delivers Israelites. He takes them to the Red Sea, splits the Red Sea. Then the Egyptian army come behind. He caves the waters in, destroys the army. Here they are, free, free at last, right? They're going through the desert 50 days. They get to Mount Sinai. And what's the first thing God has to say to them? There is no God but me. They've learned that. They've watched it happen. Listen, if, if, you want to get a, if you want a life of hope and a life of real purpose, meaning, and peace, it starts here. It doesn't mean you're not going to have troubles. It doesn't mean you're not going to have difficulties. But it starts right here where God is your only God and there are no other gods you worship. And it makes sense. Settle it once and for all. You know, settle it in your head, settle it in your heart that there is one God, and that is the God of the Bible, and that's who you will worship and serve. Sounds like what Jesus says to Satan when he was tempted. So how do we command, how do we follow this? How do we obey the first command? Well, that sounds kind of like a simple question, but it is worth looking at. Number one, acknowledge God as the only God. Regularly, when you're praying, just acknowledge God. God, you are it. You are God above all. There is none like you. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You are God. There are no others. Acknowledge it in your prayers. Just declare him and acknowledge it. Step two, invite God to be the God of your life every day. Every day. God controls the universe. Uh, he loves you. He made you for a reason and a purpose. So make sure you invite him to be the God of your life every single day. I hope you'll do this with me as we even get in the practice of it. You would think of all people the Egyptians would know, right? Excuse me. The Israelites would know that he is God of all gods. And yet what do we see them do? As soon as Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments, they're worshiping a false god. After everything, they lived in a hot house. I mean, for 50-plus days, they were in a hot house where God was providing and delivering and splitting Red Seas. I mean, they've seen it on display. They should have been spiritual giants over a few months after everything they experienced. And yet, Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments, and they're worshiping a golden calf. Commandment number one, there is no God but me, people. That's what he's saying to them. So every day, I would encourage you to ask God, invite him to be the God of your life. You know, the Jewish folk, religious Jewish people, not all Jewish people are religious, but religious Jewish people, like the Orthodox Jews, Messianic Jews, and so many others, they every single day, every morning and every night, some of them do this more, they share a prayer called the Shema, S-H-E-M-A, the Shema. And, and, and it's a, a simple prayer. It's actually longer than what I'm going to show you. But it, it's a prayer that, that, that goes like this. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. That's the beginning of the prayer. Shema is the first word. It means listen. Here's, here's that, that line in English. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Every morning they get up out of, if you ever watch the Chosen series, you'll see Jesus sometimes, he'll wake up, he'll get on the edge of his bed, or he'll get on his knees, and he'll put his hands up and put them on his lap, and he'll say this. Sometimes you don't hear it, but it's called the Shema, and it's a restating of the first command. It's acknowledging that God is the only God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There aren't a bunch of gods. There's just one God. And the prayer continues with, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might or all your strength. Still, every day, they pray this every morning and every night before they go to bed, reminding themselves that he alone is God and there is no other. So it makes sense that we invite God to be the God of our lives every day. Great way to practice this is, is when you're during your prayer time. If you don't have a Bible time where you get into God's Word, I'm not just talking about a little verse. I'm talking about where you spend some quality time in reading the Scriptures. Make sure you have that uh, uh, you know, in your schedule every day. 
Uh, I do mine at the beginning of the day. After I get ready for the day, I sit down. And, and inevitably, when I get too busy and I wait and do it later, it doesn't work out so well. This week, this week, I, I had a real busy morning, and so I jumped into some other stuff, and I didn't read. I'll get it to this afternoon. I'll get to it this afternoon. And sure enough, 1030 at night, I hadn't read or prayed in a real good quality time with the Lord. And I grabbed my Bible, and I worked through that chapter, at least one chapter. We're reading through the book of Romans right now. And uh, I read through that, and I, I laid it down. I was so tired, and I laid it. Lord, I just thank you for the, And Lord, and I woke up the next day, and I don't even remember praying. But what, why am I sharing this with you? Because for me, I got to do it earlier in the day, or else I am going to fall asleep in the arms of Jesus without saying a whole lot. <laughs> So I, I need to do it in the fir- earlier part of the day. It might be for you. Maybe that's lunchtime. Maybe that's right after you get home from work. I don't know. But the point is, make sure you have that time with the Lord. And make sure after you get done reading and you're talking to the Lord, to invite God to be the God of your life every single day. We can do this together. Which brings me to step three. Accept God's love for you through Jesus Christ. Accept God's love. God is a God of love. It's not what he has. It's who he is. His nature is love. First commandment teaches us there is only one God. No one, nothing is more powerful. Nothing is greater than him. The message of the Bible from the beginning to the last is that he loves you. I'm not making this up, guys. I've read the whole book a number of times. That's the message. He is a God who made you to love you, and he wants relationship with you. That's the message of the book. And everything he's done to make that relationship possible, ultimately bringing us to Jesus. God wants relationship with us. Here's the truth. God wants us to keep the Ten Commandments. We're blessed when we do keep the Ten Commandments. Imagine a world where everybody kept the Ten Commandments. It would be a much better place. But here's the thing. No matter how hard we try, what happens? We fail. We fail. Thou shalt not lie. How many of us have lied? Thou shalt not steal. How many of us have stolen something? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Yeah, I got you on that one, Vern. I've never done that. But then Jesus comes along and says, if you look at a woman and lust after you've committed adultery in your heart, boom, we've all lusted. We're all adulterers at heart. So why does God give us commands? This is so important. I shared this last week, but it's so important. I don't ever want you to forget this. One of the primary reasons God gives the commands is so that we will realize we're sinners and we can't keep them. Why would God do that? Because when we realize we're sinners, we see our need for a Savior. One of the main reasons God gives the commands is so that you and I will see our need for a Savior to save us from our sin. It's essential that we realize we're sinners in need of a Savior. Because if we don't, we'll die in our sin. We'll die without a Savior. And then what's our future? The certain and fearful expectation of the wrath and judgment of God on us. You don't have Jesus. You have judgment. You have hell. God doesn't want that for us. So he sends us Jesus. In fact, he himself becomes a man. He lives among us. That's why he could say at the end of Matthew, all authority in heaven and earth is mine. Because he's God in the flesh. You know, I've shared this so many times. Jesus goes, I'll never quit sharing it because it never gets old to me. Jesus goes to the cross. He's God, right? He goes to the cross. He takes on, why is he at the cross? Why is God being crucified? Because he's taking on himself the punishment for your sin. So that the wrath, his wrath and judgment doesn't have to fall on you for your sin. Jesus says, I'm a human. I'll take it for them. He takes all the wrath and all the judgment for all who would ever believe and trust in him. That's what the cross is all about. That's why it was horrific. That's why it was so painful. That's why he cried, Father, why have you forsaken me? Because he wanted us to know he was taking the full brunt of all our sin in our place. He was our substitute 
so that we wouldn't have to take that punishment. But the only way you get that gift is if you, Jesus said it over and over, repent and believe. Repent, it means turn from your way to the right way, Jesus. Believe means trust with your life and who he is and what he did for you. Like you would put a parachute on and jump out of a plane. That's trust. You trust him with your life, how you live it, what you do, what you say, what you involve yourself in, your attitude. And we fail. And every time we fail, we go back to the cross and remember that he paid for our failures. He paid so we could be forgiven. And so we trust him with our lives. Have you had a place and a time in your life where you've been able to repent and believe? If you haven't, why not do it right now? That's what this book is all about. It all leads to this. So that we will know and believe and receive what he did for us. So right now, if you would, let's all just bow our heads. If you have never repented and believed, I want to challenge you to do it right now. I don't want to, I'm not pressuring you. If you're not ready, don't do it. Jesus came because he loved you and he wanted to make a way for you to be restored in relationship with the living God, forgiven, cleansed. Right now, you can pray and say, Jesus, forgive me. I've been doing life my way, my own rules, not yours. I know I've sinned again and again. I'm sorry, forgive me. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me, took the punishment I deserve in my place. Jesus, I believe you rose from the dead for me. You conquered hell and sin and death for me so I could have new life with you. I don't have it all figured out, but Jesus, help me to live for you, to trust and live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we, we have a tendency to see the Ten Commandments, as well as a lot of the scriptures, as just these hard rules, these difficult, you know, these difficult uh, burdens that God puts on us in life. But realize that's not what they are. No more than that, that manual is making this a burden for me. He means it for help. He means it so that we can be healthy and whole. He gives it so we can have life, real life, worth living. But we need Jesus. And if you're going to experience hope and you're going to experience meaning and purpose and you're going to experience peace in this messed up world, you need Jesus. And the Ten Commandments point us to Jesus. The cool thing is, is once we accept him, he strengthens us, empowers us. We grow and, and mature. And then all of a sudden, we're able to keep the Ten Commandments better than we ever could before. Not that we're perfect, but we're able to do so much better with his help. They truly are a gift from God. And they're not meant to bind you. They're meant to free you. Let's bow together. Father, thank you for the truth of your word it's just another example today of how the world will look at the Ten Commandments and see restrictions. Uh, they see a heavy burden. Um, they see you repressing us. But Lord, that is not at all what you meant it to do. You want to free us. You want to give us words so we can live life, true life. Father, thank you for your truth. Thank you that even with the Ten Commandments pointing out our failures... They also point us to Christ, to Jesus, the Savior. Father, help us to be your people, continuing knowing you, growing, and going in service so that other people can see you when they see us, your love, your goodness, your grace, all thanks to Jesus. We honor you, we praise you, and we pray in Jesus' name that you'd continue to help us on this path of serving you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.